this one couple that you know i before we would hang we'd smoke and like talk through our rules together the rules this couple had she was just like no penetration like he can't penetrate you like that's my only rule which normal rule happen okay. you know totally get it cool uh and you know we start doing stuff and at one point he was like on top of me but nothing was happening like we were just like kissing he was on top but she i guess couldn't see or the angle was weird for her because she just starts screaming penetration penetration intercourse like an alarm just repeating the words like an alarm he's and not she, inside you he's just no, on top of he's you. just on top of me when i literally am going he's not inside me <laughs> and she starts throwing shit she's like throwing shoes she, they had like bongs that she starts throwing them oh no i'm like holy shit i like just like pulled up my skirt thing and was like and i just ran and left i left my shoes there uh, it was only a few blocks from my house, so that was like lucky. I could just like, I just walked home barefoot. But first, a word from our sponsors. Do you have a dick? Do you want to boost your sexual performance with that dick? Of course you do. Do it naturally without the nasty prescription drugs and side effects when you use my sponsor this week, Joy Mode. Get 20% off your first order when you visit usejoymode.com slash manwhore. Now let's get to the show. The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by Bloom, an erotic audio platform dedicated to giving you the best oral sex you can have. With hundreds of sexy stories in three different languages and a sleek, user-friendly design, Bloom stories are the right fit to get you in the mood. Get 50% off an annual membership or 20% off a monthly membership when you use promo code MANHOR at bloomstories.com. Welcome to the Manhor Podcast. Happy hump day to all the fan whores, the whoreheads, the pod pervs, the billy babes. How about this one? The slut stayers. I don't know about that last one, but this is Billy Presida, and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Slut stayers? What is that? I guess you got to make it to the end of the pod to know. But anyways, hey, how you doing? This week on the show, I have got on stand-up comedian and TV writer and podcaster Ashley Ray. She is black, she is bi, she is poly, and she's going to drop some experienced knowledge and stories on y'all in just a little bit. But first, I think I'm going to have some show dates for y'all coming up in the new year. There will be another Naked Comedy Show in January. Get excited. More details coming soon, but for now, I will tell you that on January 1st, New Year's Day, I am going to be doing a roast battle at The Stand. Having done a roast battle in the post core, we're going to see if I can uh, brush off these insult skills of mine. I love roast battles. They're super fun to watch. Even when they're like bad, they're still kind of funny to watch. It's So it's a good time. I'll try to get a link in the show notes. My brain has been like breaking uh, over the last, I don't know, six years of the news. I didn't really start watching cable news and like paying attention on the daily to what's going on in politics really until the, the orange guy was gaining traction. And I was like, Oh fuck, that can't actually happen. Can it? And I started like overpaying attention. I started realizing I was having like cable news on in the background of like me beating off. And just like when you're masturbating with Rachel Maddow in the background, I think that's a good time to like reassess and reevaluate some things. So I've been trying to replace the news uh, in, in my day to day with sports news. Like I'm a big New York Jets fan, have been long time. Just like now I'm kind of trying to get in the nitty gritty. I'm every day I'm watching the press conference with the head coach. I'm watching press conferences with our special teams coordinator. And if you don't know what that is, just know that like no one ever tends to care about that guy. Yeah, but I'm I'm watching his nine minutes with the with the press corps because I'm just like anything to make me not turn on the real news. And I honestly think it's making things a little healthier. I mean, I am just becoming unhealthily obsessed in a different space, but it's like a slightly less depressing space. And it also kind of takes a break 
from February to August, which I like. I listen to my short daily crooked media news podcast. I listen to my my uh, Pod Save America. I still watch Rachel on Monday nights. I'm not always beating off when I do so. And then I just like I try to keep any other like extracurricular news stuff to a minimum. And I just feel a little a little healthier because of it. I don't know. Maybe you've also been trying to wean off the terror tube. And just know that like I appreciate how difficult it is to try to stop caring about the things that are kind of the most important to the world at large. I hope uh, like me, you can find something that's just like really, really important to you and the people who wear the same colored t-shirts on Sundays that you do. Let's go back to arguing about shit that's not important, shall we? Such as this. Uh, recently in the champagne room, I got a complaint about a butcher box ad read I did, I think, a couple weeks ago. Uh, that Someone called me out for using a nonstick pan with a steak, and I'm going to come clean real quick. I just improvised the term nonstick pan because I know that that is a cooking thing that is out there. I don't really I don't know what I'm doing. After more than one person chastised me a little bit, I had to be like, what is a nonstick pan? And then they told me and then I had to go check my pans. I don't even own a nonstick pan. OK, everybody, I made the steak in a sterling silver Cuisinart pan, totally approved for steak making. Don't at me. Get off my back. But then order some baby back, 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 ribs. Oh, I gotta stop smoking. That one was tough. So, anyways, still go to butcherbox.com slash man whore and like use a stick or nonstick or whatever pan you want. I just want some hot meat in my mouth. Uh, I got an email from one of y'all, but first I have to to set up the email. I have to announce that next week for Hot Movie Night, we have a movie selection. Yes, we are going to be watching the 1976 classic, The Opening of Misty Beethoven, which may sound like a really lofty name for a porno. But again, remember, this is this was the golden age of porn. That's what we do on Hot Movie Night. We watch retro era adult films that have like dialogue and plot and character development and many consider it uh, the crown jewel of the golden age of porn and uh, and yeah so th- so this movie it's actually an er- an adult erotic take on my fair lady and when i made this announcement on patreon I got an email that said, hey, Billy, glad to see the note about the opening of Misty Beethoven. I watched it a year or so ago. Radley Metzger, a.k.a. Henry Paris, was a fascinating director. I highly recommend his bisexual movie Score, which is sort of a pornographic comedic who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. During the pandemic, I wrote a play set in 1973 in which the filming of a movie very much like Score is part of the plot. I'll let you know if there's ever a reading or production in NYC. Yeah, I'm shopping it. I also recommend Metzger's The Licorice Quartet from 1970. Thanks for all you do, as they say, and happy holidays. Mark. P.S. As Mark clearly has more to tell us about Henry Paris's work, he says, Have you seen Metzger's Naked Came the Stranger? And did you ever hear about the history of the best-selling hoax novel on which it was based? I wrote an article about the novel for a site called The Clyde Fitch Report a few years ago, but the site was discontinued. PSS, which I think it's supposed to be PPS, but hey, I'm not here to to monitor your acronyms. He says, do you know about the Rialto Report website, a regular treasure trove? Mark, you pornography enthusiast. Um, Wow, that was was the most anyone's ever had to say to me about 1970s pornos. I have not seen or heard of really any of those movies because I was also like crazy, 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 not alive yet. So join us for Hot Movie Night. Click the link in the show notes for more information. But the the cliff notes is you got to be a member of my Patreon community and you got to be in the champagne room. By the way, the date and time has changed. I am so sorry. We'll be on Tuesday, December 20th at 930 p.m. Eastern time. Did we catch all that? One of the people I hope joins us for Hot Movie Night is also our fan whore appreciation moment. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Lindsay Penizik for supporting the Man Whore Podcast on Patreon. 
You are a peach of a patron and just quite the princess of the champagne room. Thanks for uh, being part of the community. Thanks for supporting the show. Hope to see you on Tuesday. Become a member today. Support the whore you love at patreon.com slash man whore podcast. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash man whore podcast. Or download the Patreon app and find me on there. And now for this week's guest, Ashley Ray, uh, you know, talked a lot about solo poly in this episode. And as I say to Ashley, I don't even always understand how to describe solo poly to like a lay person. There are some of these terms like within sex positivity that they have definition, but they also kind of don't. And then people start appropriating and overusing and misusing so much that sometimes the words tend to have no meaning at all anymore. And and then sometimes it's just more like now there's confusion about what it means. Non-binary? Don't, please don't ask me to like properly define it because I'm sure I'll say something and 17 different people with 17 different corrections will hit me up. Likewise with solo poly, the tenet of it does seem to be that your most important relationship is with yourself and the priority is with yourself. And it's a label, it's a style of non-monogamy that I think a lot of people are, are starting to experiment with as they try to prioritize themselves. You know, whether it's because they need to focus on their careers or maybe they just got out of a really long, bad relationship and they're trying to do some of their, you know, self-work while also still <laughs> getting laid and enjoying intimacy. And, you know, I'm, I'm not romantically available right now. Any of the lovers in my life know I, I, I am not over wallet, no lady, but I still enjoy intimacy and intimacy doesn't mean sex. I mean, we all know I enjoy sex, but I enjoy intimacy and I enjoy um, being close with someone. I, and I even enjoy being really emotionally connected to my lovers. It's far more fun to fuck people that like I care about and I like to talk to. Like we will have hotter sex together if we have seen each other cry. I don't know what it is. I have definitely sometimes held someone who was like having a hard time and then gone a boner. And I'm just like, I think taking care of someone is, is hot to me. So in a way, I feel like I'm kind of practicing solo poly in that I have been establishing some new relationships in my life. They're not just fuck buddies necessarily, but none of them are like a girlfriend. And like Ashley, I consider myself single even though I do have relationships with lovers who I care about. I enjoy that there's like a way in which one can do that. I just feel like, I guess I've just never really felt the need to call it solo poly. I've called it single. And so, I don't know, maybe that's where the question is right now, where what's the difference between solo polyamory and casually dating or dating multiple people without slapping any of them with the label of boyfriend or girlfriend or significant other. I don't know the answer to that one. That's a little debate for you to have in your brain or with your polycule or in the champagne room, our discord server, maybe something to uh, kick off in the episode discussion channel. But anyways, Ashley Ray been following her on Twitter for years. Very funny. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Don't take it from me. The Presida family has been using Athletic Greens for a long time. If anything, I'm the one who's late to the game. Both my sisters and brothers-in-law and my mom all use AG1 to start their mornings with better gut health. You know, you may not always associate me with uh, healthy habits, but I come from a very fit and athletic family. I knew this stuff was legit when my youngest sister's fiance started doing it a couple years ago because, like, he's one of these biohacker guys. He's a former Division I swimmer. Like, I know he knows his stuff, and he swears by AG1. Athletic Greens is a simple micro habit that gets you those vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and adaptogens that your diet may be missing. Yeah, I know mine is. Look, if anyone needs Athletic Greens, it's definitely me. I mean, none of the thing I eat says probiotics on the nutritional label. And uh, hey, you know what? I bet you could use some salad water too. Oh, and did, I think I forgot to say, it tastes great. It's like my favorite green thing to put in my body now. So are you going to join me with AG1 in the morning? To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. 
The travel packs were great. You know, they were super easy to bring on my trip last week to Los Angeles, so I wouldn't miss a day. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash manwhore. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash manwhore to take ownership over your health. Gym bros, imagine you had a pre-workout supplement for sex. Well, let me tell you about Joy Mode, our longtime sponsor. Regular listeners know that Joy Mode has become a routine part of my pre-play party, pre-new lover, first fuck date, boost my blood flow program. It's super easy to use. You know, about an hour to four hours before game time, I mix a packet of Joy Mode in a glass of water and I slurp that down. I feel confident knowing it gives me a targeted vitamin boost for better blood flow, which helps bring better boners. Unlike sketchy dick pills or prescription drugs, Joy Mode has no side effects. So if you want to spice things up in bed and boost your sexual performance, you want to try Joy Mode. They've got a special offer for Fanhorn Nation. Get 20% off your first order at usejoymode.com slash manhor or use promo code manhor at checkout. One more time, that's use joy mode, U-S-E-J-O-Y-M-O-D-E dot com slash manhor for 20% off your first order. Then when your partner tickles the back of your neck and you feel yourself just mm, growing, make eye contact with your cock, then look up to the sky and think, thanks joy mode. This is crazy. I just heard God on his podcast. Yeah, of course, God has a podcast. God is frequently depicted as a cis white man in a position of power who want all of humanity to be just like him. Yeah, I, yeah, he's got a podcast and it's called The God Pod. It's a fun comedy podcast. You know, I always thought God's podcast would be more like hippy dippy, woo woo spirituality. But, you know, but he's a funny dude. And uh, God Pod is frequently listed in Apple's top 100 comedy podcasts. So you can't go wrong with adding the God Pod to your rotation. It's always funny. Find the God Pod wherever you listen to podcasts. And this actually might be a selling point, but they put it down as a note to podcaster. So I'm just going to read it to you. The God Pod is irreverent and does contain salty language. And some topics are not meant for children. If you believe this information would be helpful for your listeners, please feel free to inform them of this. So, you know. God is filthy, maybe even filthier than me. And we thank the God Pod for sponsoring an episode of this show. You know, I I'm polyamorous, bisexual. I've um starting in college, that's when I I was like a member of my college's women's club, which, you know, is like the feminist, sex positive group on campus. Uh, eventually we started like a the, someone above and a great above me started it I think I don't know but like a queer student union thing I joined that and we would do these like queer parties every year where we would just like play porn on the walls and like in the student like Goodrich Hall <laughs> yeah. like you know where people like studied and did homework and we would just be like okay there's going to be porn on the walls this admins are like they're party. expressing themselves yeah it's okay. <laughs> you know and uh my junior year we brought uh Jizz Lee to campus she's like a famous yeah. um uh, I believe they mm. they are a famous porn star uh who was so inspirational at that time like I was super into the Crash Pad series I love Crash yeah. Pad <laughs> It's one of the few places I've paid for. Yeah. And like, so I interviewed them and I interviewed people who like, you know, did stuff at the Amsterdam Porn Festival and all that stuff. And so I always was just like a sex positive person in school. I would do that, like be like, oh, let's bring, you know, like people who sell sex toys to campus. Let's bring, you know, have all these open panels. Uh, I brought Tristan Tormino to campus my senior year to talk about like polyamory because that's when I was like, I'm doing this. So I always was kind of open about talking about sex and all that stuff. I never felt a lot of shame around it. And so when I moved to Chicago after graduating and started like writing and performing, sex was just like a natural thing to talk about. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And yeah. Wait, where'd that comfort come from? Uh, I it's definitely how I was raised. I want to say, I, you know, my mom wasn't like a big shame person. Mm. You know, I think shame had been pretty harmful to her in her life, and she didn't want to replicate that with me. So she was very like sexual just, shame. Yeah, like sh- sexual shame, shame of talking about things. You know, she her parents were super religious, mm. and so you're not supposed to talk about certain things and. 
you know, that leaves people open to a lot of like abuse and just bad experiences because you don't know what is supposed to be good or what's supposed to be right. Mm. Uh, if <laughs> I'm a TV person, I let me plug a TV. I say in my <laughs> podcast, if you recently watched a friend of the family on Peacock, you know, it's the dramatized version of the documentary abducted in plain sight where this guy like grooms an entire family and this girl and they're, he's able to do it because they're so Mormon. They're so religious that they never talk about sex. Or Wait, is this the one with that creepy one where they're in car being like, brother, or whatever? yeah, yeah, brother B, brother that, B. <laughs> that already scared me enough. I was it's, like, I didn't yeah. need to watch. <laughs> and it's just, you know, when you have that, it can be religion, it can be shame, it can be just strict parents. But when you put up those walls around those topics, yeah. it just leaves people open to, you know, abuse or bad sexual experiences or just. Mm you know, feeling shame around finding themselves in that way. And so my mom didn't do that with me. She mm. never, you know, she was open about it. She like, let me be in Girl Scouts where they like talk to us openly in like sex ed. It was like more liberal than the one that at my school. So like, I had a good sense of things mm. <laughs> and what was normal and like, what wasn't normal. So, you know, I think because of her and she also just like had a lot of just joy in who she was and like just bodies and people, you know, she was like one of the one of the things she would always say was like uh, about farting was like, it's better to let it out and be ashamed than keep it in and bust a vein. Wow. (laughs) So deep, right? Deep, but also just it's cool because I think normally we think like kind of maybe our generation will are the ones who will try to not instill shame but yeah. you kind of you got a generational head start like right? yeah yeah my mom is like uh, your mom actively talked to you about shame she felt yeah right and, and so- yeah and you know would say stuff like that and yeah she's older like all my siblings are like 20 years older than me mm. so you know i was like her i'm her youngest youngest so i think by then she was like i got this i know how to do it now <laughs> um so yeah i just never felt a lot of shame and then i also uh I was engaged for most of college. I like met someone in high school uh, my junior year and we were so into each other and we both, it was, it was kind of cool because we both like were queer kids. Like we met in like a youth group thing. We met through all these like queer groups in, in our little stupid town where we grew up. And so we were like these two weirdos who like found each other and we felt really safe just, you know, experimenting with each other, being mm-hmm. with each other. And I think that like at that age, especially that's so important. Like very few people have a partner that they can like try new things with and be that expressive with. And, you know, he like, we were both just kind of didn't feel like shame around talking about that stuff or mm-hmm. just being really open about what we wanted to try or had tried in our past. Uh, So by the time I got to college, we decided to stay together. My sophomore year, he proposed. Uh, So the whole time, like, that's how I was like, we should try polyamory. We should try all this because we lived, I was in school in Massachusetts. He lived in Illinois. We were so far apart for most of the time that we were like, let's get creative. Yeah. Um, In retrospect, though, that is stupid. Don't ever do that. Don't ever ever go to college with the person you dated in high school. Break up. Be smart. (laughs) I could have had way more crazy sex with people on campus. Uh, Wait, so but if you were doing poly, why weren't you able to to do that while maintaining the relationship abroad? So it was interesting because so freshman year, you know, monogamous, just dating. Sophomore year, he proposes. We're engaged, still monogamous, and then my junior year, I went abroad. I lived in Germany, and he went to school in Vermont that year. So we were still really far apart, but it was like so far that we both were like, you know you're in a new place. I'm in a new place. Let's still be monogamous and like figure this out. And also he came and stayed with me in Europe for like months. So we were together and like, we really weren't sure if we wanted to be polyamorous. It Mm. was kind of just like, you know, we are in different places, but you know, we're just, we just got engaged. We're figuring things out. It's also a newer concept. I mean, I'm assuming you're at least vaguely close in my age. Like Uh, it was barely a word people said. Yeah. At least when I was in college, I guess for me, I like, I, I was, I mean, I started reading about it, I guess, when I was like 13, 14, because I watched The L Word growing up and they talked about it. And then I was a really pretentious teenager. Mm-hmm. 
And I read a lot of uh, like Simone de Beauvoir and <laughs> just all these existentialist writers who were like, uh, monogamy, what is it? <laughs> so I like always had these kind of open concepts of like love doesn't have to look like one thing. Um, I think it also helped. My mom had a daycare in our house. She hates when I say this, but she had a like a daycare, like the first floor of our house yeah. was a child care center. And then we basically lived upstairs, but she took care of kids from like six months old to 12 years old from the time I was like six months to 18, like my entire life, there were always other children in my house. Um, and like kids that I grew up with who I were always in my house, kind of like siblings. And they saw my mom as like their mom. Yeah. You know, there were people in my neighborhood who just like, if they ran into my mom at the store, they would call her mom. Like it was, I was just so used to other people kind of, putting her like seeing her that way and sharing my mom in that way. And she also is just like this loving, caring person who like loved taking care of kids, you know, just if there was a kid who was, you know, was sick or their parents didn't get them gifts, she would always step in. She was just really a sweet person. So when other kids saw her as like a parent, like her, their mom, uh, I don't know. I didn't feel jealous. I was just always kind of like, yeah, my mom is great. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I know. She's super awesome. Like, I can't I can't keep this lady to myself. Like, look at her. She's she's just oh, isn't she filling you with self-esteem? Like, she's yeah. so great. So, I wonder if she had this a similar effect on them. Uh, maybe like if they came to her with any questions in the sex yeah. dating my body realm and maybe she was able, able to just sprinkle a little like don't worry what your mom said yeah it was like that you know i mean she saw she took care of kids from all over this town we were in it was mm. so diverse and you know i remember kids would come to her with problems or she could tell there were kids who were different or had issues and she uh she was very used to i think taking care of kids who really did i mean she had four kids herself and my oldest brother has like developmental issues. So she was used to, you know, speaking to people like on their terms and slowing things down and being like, hey, you know, mm. don't worry if your teachers are saying this or your parents are saying this or you feel this way at school. Like, hey, you're special. Like, you know, she could just make every kid feel that way. So I don't know, to me, like, the, I, I guess being used to that my whole life and being proud of it, like, seeing how my mom could make other people happy. I, I Hey, your relationships with your parents and how you see love in your household defines, like, how you see relationships. And my mom was never in a, in a monogamous relationship. Like, well, she was. She was in a monogamous <laughs> relationship. But... <laughs> it was it was like never normal <laughs> do tell so like we lived in rockford illinois which is like this midwest town that is very close to wisconsin like five minute drive from wisconsin uh and my mom and i lived there in a house and then my stepdad lived in chicago hmm. uh and they were together for i'm pretty much my my whole life um they separate when i was like 20 something yeah they were together the whole time but he refused to move to Rockford. She didn't want to move to Chicago and give up her business. Mm -hmm. So they were like, well, you live there. I'll live here. Okay. <laughs> and like, we're engaged together every weekend. He would come to us uh, or we would go to Chicago some weekends. Uh, if it was like a holiday or she was closed, we would go stay in Chicago for like the weekend. So to me, it was always like, you can love someone and you don't even have to be in the same city. Like, it was just, I was just like, long distance relationships are totally normal. Like, what, you know, love yeah. can look like so many things. I didn't have sort of this perception of, oh, a person you are you love, you're married to them, you stay in the house together, you're, you know. You have the same bedroom, you, you have the, the same, same bedroom. Bed. Yeah, you it was, yeah. you know, I was like, they have totally separate apartments, everything, you know. And I, I loved it, honestly. I loved going to Chicago all the time and... <laughs> You know, I've I'd never saw problems with it. So I think all of that together, by the time I was in college and knew to put the word sort of polyamory to what I was doing, I feel like I already had pretty open ideas of like relationships and like mm -hmm. how they could work. And then our senior year, that's when we were both like, yeah, let's officially like, you know, I had Tristan Tormino come to campus. We read the book opening up mm -hmm. uh, ethical, you know, all the books, ethical slut, all of it. And we were like, yeah, let's officially do this. And, uh, you know, it, uh, we were together about six more months. And then <laughs> two months before graduation, we break up. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's like. And it's it, like we should have broken up then four years ago. Yeah, we should have broken up forever. Like we should have tried and this then, then or and then broken, broken up. Broken up. And it yeah. also was just kind of, I don't know. It was like. 
there were so many other issues that had caused other issues. And by this point, it was just kind of, I wanted to, I like, I was starting to understand in polyamory that I just wanted to be free in different ways that mm-hmm. I didn't like. And so, so now I'm solo poly now. And I got what I realized at that time, what I didn't like was, um, have like being like having i'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't make me sound awful it's okay Uh, to be a little awful (laughs) it's like having someone completely depend on you it's and it's not even really that it's just that like personally i lose myself a lot in that kind of dynamic Mm. like when i feel there is someone where it's like you know you're my like if i had a kid I would, that kid would be my everything, like my focus, like, Mm. you know, what I plan for in life would be centered around that. And when I have that kind of dynamic in a relationship, whether it's monogamous or polyamorous, anything that's like your primary, you're like, you know, what it's about. I just feel in my life, other things fall by the wayside, my career, you know, passions, dreams I have. And hey, I don't know, you know, maybe that's something I work out in therapy someday and I fit, Mm. whatever, but right now I feel like solo polyamory makes the most sense for me because I can maintain sort of my goals and still have relationships that are like full of love and make me happy and are great. But I never feel the pressure of like taking oh my- care of and not, prior- <laughs> I'm happy to like take care of people. That sounds like, but it's like, I never feel the pressure of like, am I making sure this person feels special am i thinking about them enough am i doing enough for them am i i don't i'm just like your mom did yeah to all those kids yeah for all those kids it's like i am one of those people who are it's like i take care of everything like i know i'd be an amazing parent because i just like i'm like (laughs) and in that relationship that's kind of how i well it was i was like a parent to this guy Mm. i was older than him like when we started dating i would do his homework because (laughs) I went to a better school. I like got better grades and I would be like, I just want you to be able to hang out. So like, yo, I can finish your homework in 30 minutes and then we can go hang. He was your mini driver. <laughs> yeah. like, you did his orgo homework so he could take you out. Oh, so you could take him out. So I was like, yeah, literally like he, t- I, like I started taking Latin in sixth grade. He took like intro to Latin his like junior year. I was like, Psh. This is child's play. Let's go hang. Yeah, I literally was like, and then two days later, his Latin teacher is calling his mom like, so all of a sudden he's been getting A's in Latin. He used to get D's. Uh, Is it possible he has a friend who goes to a private school? (laughs) And they were like, in fact, he does. In fact, that's so hyper specific guess. Because there were all she was like, didn't say is he cheat? Is this cheating? Is it no? Does he have a friend who goes to private school? There were only two (laughs) private schools in our city that taught Latin, and she was like, he knows someone at Boylan or the other school, Uh. (laughs) and they were like, and yep, that is what it is. And I was like. Oh, I just thought I was correcting it. I didn't realize he was like taking the uh, whatever I lied. But and when he was going to college, like I filled out his application, basically wrote his essay. He was Mm. like an artist. I put together a portfolio for him. I just did everything because I don't know. Like I was just like, that's what you do. You help the person you love. And his parents weren't like super active. So they were really happy. They'd be like, oh, that's great. She's like, do helping him with things. She's helping him be motivated. And yeah, I lost like, you know, a lot of drive that I could have had focused on myself, like things that I could have like accomplished for me. Uh, You know, I dedicated to this other person, which like, I don't regret. I don't, you know, I'm one of those like, you never regret any relationship. Like you learn and grow from everything. It's all worth it. But, (laughs) you know, it's one of those things where I look back and I was so young and I spent so much energy on something that didn't need that energy at Mm -hmm. that age. Yeah. You know, like if I was older, yeah, that's something I could, I'd invest that energy in a kid or, you know, if I married someone, but you know, I think at that age, you get so wrapped up in ideas of like what love is and how it's supposed to work and what a good partner looks mm-hmm. like and oh, romance and you dedicate everything in your life to someone. And so solo polyamory was a way for me to like let that go. Yeah, there's so much talk of like, I, you know, it was always like, oh, when are you too serious? And when you're serious is when you're boyfriend, girlfriend. But the thing that like my freshman year, my first ever girlfriend, we she went to Tufts. I was at NYU. In the beginning, we weren't like boyfriend, girlfriend yet. We'd said, I love yous. I was her first. She was my second, you know, sexual partner, right? So, like, it is other, for all intents and purposes, she's my girlfriend, I'm her boyfriend. But we weren't, when we were going to the different campuses, we were like, well, let's, we won't fuck other people. 
but we can hook up with other people. But then we still exactly. weren't boyfriend, girlfriend only because of that. Right. It only became quote unquote serious. It became like titled yeah. when we decided we won't do anything with anyone else. And it was like, but why was why is that the marker of when yeah, it was like, serious? It felt serious that, two months ago. Yeah, two months ago when we're like, we love each other. We feel this way about each yeah. other. I'm and coming inside you. I feel like that's serious. Exactly. <laughs> and like when we got engaged, we had a very open understanding of the concept. I don't. It was very like we're going to be engaged, but we're going to like live separately, live our lives, do different mm. things. I'm going to go abroad. But like it, we have this this trust and faith and like bond in each other in our relationship. I was I was 19 years old. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you thought we are the most mature people. Oh yeah, I was game. like, I am so mature. I was like, I'm, I'm engaged. School. I was like, I'm engaged. And I know I'm, Latin. <laughs> I know Latin. I'm at school to get my degrees. Yeah, plural. Actually, triple. I have three. And <laughs> it's not. What I mean, I, no. um, <laughs> I was just like a pretentious asshole when I went to. Co- I was literally just. I remember people being like, "It's so difficult, like coming to this school." I'm like, "I'm having a hard time," and I'd just be like, "Oh, I'm not, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> Like, I just feel like maybe, like, get to focus. I don't know. Like, you know. And because I just, I don't know. I just wanted to be, like, I have my life figured out. Like, I am just here to study, focus. And then, obviously, by my sophomore year, all of that fell apart. Like, those walls came down. Mm. I, you know, I think I was just trying to, like, protect myself in this new environment and college and, like, new people and by sophomore year, I was like this big softie who was like, oh, all my besties. Like, yeah, I do hate it here most of the time. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So so what is, uh, you know, this is a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. And I, I honestly can't always define it to somebody. What does solo poly mean to you? Yeah, to me, solo polyamory is simply polyamory or ethical non-monogamy without having a primary or tertiary ranked partners. Uh, so what does that look like though? I think I, you know, we hear that, but then it's like in practice, what, did, what, what does it, it look practice? like? Yeah. Uh, to me in practice, it's meeting everyone and their relationship needs on their personal terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, while also, you know, ensuring an understanding with all my partners that, you know, I'm never going to be fully monogamous. Mm. I, I'm never going to engage in something like primaries. Like at the end of the day, I'm going to consider myself single. Mm -hmm. you know, but you're someone that I see and care about. Yeah. So, you know, single people date. It's like I can date and there are people I've been dating for years that I care a ton about, you know, like we're best friends and we really care about each other. Uh, But at the same time, they'd be like, oh, Ashley's single, (laughs) you know, you know, (laughs) or like they have primaries or they're, you know, married in an open relationships, open marriages. uh, And they understand like, oh, I love Ashley. Like we see each other regularly, but you know, she's, she's single. She's seeing other people too. Yeah. And I seem do my thing. Uh, and then I also, you know, I, it does in a way, I think kind of different from standard polyamory. It gives me more opportunities to date people who are monogamous or not entirely sure about ethical non-monogamy. Uh, because a lot of times they're more comfortable with the idea of like, oh, you don't have like a primary partner I'm insulting or could possibly hurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, they kind of can understand like, oh, this is just kind of more like dating. Like everyone's on an even playing field. And if we do get closer, it's not like I have to stop seeing other people I'm seeing. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, so I feel like people tend to be a little more comfortable with the concept. Uh, And then also I think it just gives me more kind of flexibility. Like, If I do meet someone I really like as someone who's solo poly, you know, I have been in situations where I meet someone I really like. They've maybe never done polyamory or non-monogamy. They're open to it, but they want to get to know me first or Mm -hmm. they've done it before, but they still like to have a period of like, hey, how about for six months we just do monogamy and like get to know each other really well before we decide to, you know, escalate to whatever. Uh, And I'm fine with that. Like, I'm cool with sort of this like flow of periods so as you'll, long you'll as, get you'll lock it down for a period of time sometimes yeah as long as there's always an understanding that like this is going to be an open relationship eventually like huh. you know i think there's different ways you get to know people right and yeah. i've had it happen just kind of uh naturally where it's like you connect with someone so closely, you get along so well, you just kind of start hanging out. You'll like, I I went on a trip with this girl. And like, after that, we just kind of started seeing each other. And then we were like, Oh yeah, I guess we've like just been hanging out with each other. And like, we went to this place together and Oh yeah. And it's like, huh? 
like are you upset that you haven't been seeing anyone else and you just kind of talk about it that way and it's like no yeah i don't mind and then but you know at some point if we want to see other people yeah let's talk about it and you know re refocus on this conversation uh but never like with the thing of like oh you're gonna be able to like change me <laughs> like, oh yeah like it's never like and then now we'll be monogamous forever it's always like okay let's talk about you know why you feel this way or what you want to get out of it. like is it that you want to get to know me more is it that you're kind of worried or afraid of like mm. how polyamory will work uh, is it that you want to know more about who else i'm seeing or what's going on in my life like what's the real conversation behind it so i i think just at the end of the day solo poly allows me all of that mm. kind of flexibility uh versus people who like have a primary or all these ranked partners who they i i honestly i can't even understand that that way of doing it <laughs> sometimes i mean so i've seen some real funky diagrams with yeah. it. dotted lines solid lines, solid lines circles metamors, <laughs> I, I, I've I seen know, I, I've seen my name in all sorts of weird configurations oh, yeah. around it. Oh, like, man, as a solo, I'm like a free agent, basically. <laughs> and I see my name on like all these like in other dynamics and stuff. I've been in the I've seen the wildest polycules and I'm just like, yeah, you guys are fun. Uh, peace, you know, <laughs> like, and it's like I can just do Call that. me for the party. <laughs> yeah, it's like I can just do that without being like, OK, I need to gather the polycule and like, you know, here's my exit address to the group and <laughs> You know, for me, I like that. Yeah, it's there's so many ways of doing it. And I think that's like yeah. my biggest thing with polyamory is telling people there's so many ways to do it. And not all of them require you living in a house with nine people. So, yeah, so many people right now, I think, who are trying to expand their I mean, she's my fucking sister sent me up. Uh, I mean, I don't know if Emily, Rad- I don't know how to say her last name, Emily Radikowski, Radjowski, whatever. Sounds right. The, the hot chick from the Blurred Lines m- yeah, music yeah, yeah. video. That Right. So she put out an episode apparently yesterday about non-monogamy yeah. now is she the i don't i don't know the i'm gonna listen I'll, but but people are looking into yeah. other options than I monogamy went on, uh jamila jamil's podcast and talked about I listened it to some and, of that, yeah. yeah and like you know i did uh why won't you date me with nicole byer like a year or two ago and yeah people are talking about it there's like more shows about it there's some documentaries most of them are bad yeah. so many bad documentaries but, but people are like searching for like, yeah. what, what's a new label I can do? But what, the problem is, is I think so many, what you were just talking to of the reminding that what you like about poly and, or solo poly is that like you can do it so many ways. I think so many people are just looking for like prescribed ways to do it yeah. with a title and like and uh, a, a bullet rules. point. And yeah, bullet and a list points of and guidelines. <laughs> and they want to believe it's as easy as just kind of slotting into it. And I think books like The Ethical Slut kind of give people that impression because it makes it seem very like, you do this, you do this, you do this, boom, mm. easy, you know, and the reality is always so much more complicated. Mm. The reality is, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's human emotions. You never, that's like the key to every person who gets polyamory is like, you cannot at the end of the day, control the human emotions of like, Hey, I thought I would only want to have sex with other people, but I actually have started to have deeper feelings for this other person. Yeah. And that's something you have to be able to talk about and go like, okay, well, if that happens, what's going to happen? And so many people are just like, well, that's not going to happen because we said we had the rule. So it's just not going to happen. And it's like, well, what if it happens? And it's like, well, it's not going to happen because we said in our list it's not going to happen. And it's like, okay, but when it does happen... What are we doing? What are you going to do? You spent too much time preparing your rules. You didn't prepare for how are we going to emotionally engage with these things we can't predict. predict. We have to be able to come together and talk about them. And talk about it. And so often... They can't, people can't talk about it. Most of you'll, you'll just see like people like break up and just kind of run away from those issues and be like, oh, you know, it was this person's fault or blah, blah, blah. Or they run back to monogamy and they, go like, yeah, see, it didn't back work. To monogamy and it's like, I, you know, usually it's like there were a million other problems before that that mm-hmm. could have been addressed. Uh, so, yeah, I, I feel like. And also as a woman, I think there's. A lot of times this idea that most polyamorous women are only doing it because they are with a man who's like insisting on it. Mm. Uh, And when I kind of started out being poly, people were like, oh, like, you know, that's not it's it's for a guy. And, you know, when I was single, like after we I broke up with my fiance and I was still poly, people were just like, I don't get it. (laughs) Like they literally they couldn't believe it. They were just like, what? I don't get it. Like, oh, so you just mean like until you find a guy who like wants to be with you like until you find a boyfriend and it was like no like i'm i'm poly and people you know 
So I think also just for me, solo polyamory is a way to really be like, I'm standing in this. Like this Mm. isn't some situation where a guy is like, you're allowed to only date other girls, but like I can date anyone and it's nothing, you know, uh, yeah, I like try to stay away from those kind of weird dynamics. And so solo polyamory. (laughs) Yeah. What was the, what was the last bullet you feel like you dodged in that regard? Oh gosh, oh gosh, I feel like I dodged so many bullets. Jeez, um, I don't know. I recently was like seeing someone who was in one of those like, oh, I can date like you know whoever I want, but my partner is monogamous and like doesn't do any sort of you know anything with anyone else. Mm-hmm. It was just it was just like weird. It was one of those situations where you could tell this person was like. I'm just waiting for him to like get this out of his system and like didn't expect him to have anything serious with anyone else. Like just thought, Oh, like you'll, you'll sleep with other people. And then of course, like, you know, we saw each other for a while and after a bit, he's like, Oh, I feel like I want to say, I love you to you. And I'm like, well, have you and your your primary partner girlfriend talked about this like you know what and he was like oh i i guess that's something we should talk about i just thought you'd want to say i love you too and i'm like it's all just a weird conversation yeah i'm like, <laughs> it's like say i love you but it's weird you're prepping me for hey later i think i might tell yeah, you yeah and then to me that was <laughs> like a way of being like i know i'm not supposed to say this which is why i'm gonna be like i want and so that i could be the one to say it and then he could be like i was just responding but i was like i feel like you're priming it that way because you know you're not supposed to say this like you like i am yeah. sure you're you know and he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to her about it. I'll, you know, I'll see. And then I never hear, we never, it never comes up again. Oh, no. And then like one day he's just like, I feel like, you know, you aren't, you're denying me love. Like you never want to say I love you. Like you're so cold. And I'm like, we literally, I said, like, I'm, that's not, I'm not breaking that boundary. Like, what? did <laughs> and- you, did you, did you love this guy? I d- like yeah I like it, I would have responded if I like if I was like oh this is appropriate like oh cool like I was would have been happy to like take that step if you haven't half futz through it the yeah first but time. it's like also I'm not gonna say I love someone who like can't be honest with like their primary partner like so it's like one of those things where it's like yeah if you can actually do what's ethical here oh I I love you for that yeah. that's gonna be really attractive to me and if you can't well then you know I ended it I was like that's too sketchy and you know there's it's just always so many red flags like i don't i've dated guys who like have a primary and they're like oh you know i want to propose and they'll ask me to like help pick out engagement rings and then they're like don't ever tell her that you help me with this and it's like (laughs) it's like okay i don't and it's like you want to reach out and be like girl (laughs) What you are engaged in here is an issue, but it's like, you know, people have to have their own rules and uh, comforts and okay are okay with different yeah. things. So I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just so messy with couples to me. I feel like, yeah. I don't know, having prime, all of that just seems so messy to me. You think it's easier to date one person in a couple or to date a couple? If you have, Ooh, I don't know if you have gosh. experience with I've, that. I've done both. Please, please, please. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I saw one uh, birthday orgy tweet. I don't know what uh, what level oh of solitude gosh. you have gone to. Please, I'm I'm a bisexual polyamorous <laughs> woman. Uh, I've dated couples. I've done it all. I actually, for a bit in Chicago, like that's where I moved right after college. Mm-hmm. I was really young. Uh, like could not get a real job because I didn't have degrees that mattered. Um, and... For a while, I, like, dated couples as, like, a sex worker. Like, I Mm. specifically would work with couples and be like, okay, what do you guys want to do? Like, as a pro unicorn, I guess. Uh, Which, if you're, you know, a young bi girl out there in in your 20s, not too young, (laughs) 24, 20, you know, good age. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, you're in, you like threesomes. Hey, it's a good way to make a living. Kind of. It's also horrible sometimes. So, you were only, you were only doing sex work with couples? Yeah interesting uh because you charge so much more it wasn't like oh i offered a couple's rate it's like i offer a unicorn experience oh, you know it's love. like yeah and what that's, was the website name I love you know I, oh, no. I just you know did the <laughs> usual ones like post i just posted you in, just the post in places yeah, yeah and because that's, that's like what those couples are looking for the what you know they're like the couples who are like, yeah, we'll look for an escort who has like a couple, right? And they're the ones who are like, well, we just want to like open a dating app and find like a unicorn who like 
you know, wants to cuddle with us and hang out and, you know, it's just, it's kind of different with that sort of perspective around it <laughs> or, you know, so that's what I did. And it, also I lived in like Logan Square, Chicago, like hipster haven where it's like, you know, all these like pro sex, like sex positive people if you haven't paid for sex like what kind of ally are you <laughs> yeah you know it was very like oh you know that is more ethical to like pay someone who's interested in this than to trick some bisexual girl on a dating app who's like oh i just wanted to date you know your girlfriend and now you're telling me this is a unicorn situation uh so be, you know people like yeah that's way more you know ethical and cool and i mean it mostly was really fun uh there was like a couple that i met that way that i dated for a while there was some horrible experiences uh there was <laughs> this one couple that you know i before we would hang we'd smoke and like talk through our rules together and the rules this couple had she was just like no penetration like he can't penetrate you like that's my only rule which normal rule uh-huh. happened you know totally get it i was like yeah got it cool uh and you know we start doing stuff and at one point he was like on top of me but nothing was happening like we were just like kissing he was on top but she, I guess, couldn't see or the angle was weird for her because she just starts screaming penetration, penetration, intercourse, like an alarm, just repeating the words like an alarm. He's and not she, inside you. He's just no, on top of you. He's just on top of me. When I literally am going, he's not inside me. <laughs> And she starts throwing shit. She's like throwing shoes. She, they had like bongs that she starts throwing them. Oh no. I'm like, holy shit. I like, I still had like most of my clothes on. Like I had a bodysuit and stuff on. I like just like pulled up my skirt thing and was like, he was not inside. Like, ch- and I just ran and left. I left my shoes there. Uh, it was only a few blocks from my house. So that was like lucky. I could just like, I just walked home barefoot. But. <laughs> That that's like the ho- that is like the nightmare threesome scenario. Yeah, it's just her like like an alarm, just screaming penetration, intercourse, intercourse. Pen- <laughs> like I was just like, are you a robot? Like what is ha- what have you scanned? Calm down. Uh, that was like that's my worst story. Honestly, uh, the rest of it was pretty nice. Like just, just some broken bongs. That's okay. yeah, broken bongs. Their stuff. I lost a pair of shoes. It was fine. <laughs> But otherwise, it was just like rich couples who'd be like, we want to just like make you dinner and have wine and like yeah. live out this cool person fantasy. Um, and then the couple I dated, like they were cool. But I would say, oh, that is tough, which is harder. I think dating someone who is dating one person in a couple is harder. Yeah. Because uh, you have to have a lot of trust in that person being like honest and open communication. Uh, it's like a weirder dynamic sometimes if they like want you to befriend their primary or if like you engage in like the same circles as their primary Mm. like that all can be really difficult to navigate and sometimes it's like maybe the main person gets polyamory and like you two are great but then they have like a partner who doesn't who like isn't kind of down and then you know you like exist in the same communities. Like I don't know, Chicago is a small, like it's big, but it the, the communities are kind of tiny. And like I would be dating someone, and they'd have like a primary who clearly wasn't happy about non monogamy, and then they go around like shit talking the people that their person dates. And you're like, okay, I'm not trying to make enemies because you don't know how to be open with your partner. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that has way more potential for errors. Versus dating a couple where it's like there's you know you're all talking you're all like you're hopefully in bed together you're yeah. all you got a group chat yeah you got a group chat you're able to just be like hey this is this this is you know it's all very open uh hopefully um you know i feel like i've had more luck in those situations <laughs> fair enough so do you go to more like clubs or like private parties kind of both i don't know uh i mean obviously during the pandemic and everything i stopped and a lot of places closed people stopped like doing a lot of parties uh so it's been like a very different new scene now Mm -hmm. um i also i don't trust a lot of the clubs anymore especially after like monkey pox and just like knowing how they work i'm like i know you guys aren't like cleaning these sheets down between people like you know, so now I mostly will do private parties because, like, I know everybody and I'm like, okay. Um, so, yeah. If it's like a super for profit venture, 
I don't trust that. Or yes. like if they have like different pricing for genders, like I don't trust oh, that. Yeah. So I just oh, don't yeah. go. And that's yeah, most all of the, like in LA, it's always like oh, twenty bucks for women, eighty bucks for dudes, uh, or yeah, they're all profit based. It's all like oh, you know, like two thousand dollars a month membership right. and but like a community based situation yeah. where it's like you know people are you know people are invited in because they're by yeah. other members and we all kind of know each other and like it's a community vibe and like yeah. we're mostly covering there costs. Are, that's a, yeah. that's such, it's just a better party environment oh yeah and i feel like there is a lot of that in la they're mostly queer spaces which is great yeah. uh but you know they all were very like because they're also great and queer and smart and responsible they were the most like covid responsible uh, and so I feel like they don't do parties and stuff as much. Uh, th- those are the ones I'm like waiting to come back. And sure. like in Chicago, the like best places were the queer sex clubs and like queer party groups. Uh, but you know, yeah, like the it, queer spaces are just generally more fun. <laughs> like just, yeah, queer spaces are just better. Like but... I go to a sports bar around those dudes, and it's it's never as fun as just hanging yeah. around at like Stonewall or Cubby exactly. or something. Like, I'm like, and it's yeah, like, I, yeah, sometimes I, you know, maybe you'll be seeing a straight couple who's like, oh, we're cool with going to this, you know, straight whatever sex place mm-hmm. or couples swingers club. And I'll check. Like, I don't I'm never da- not like I'm always like, yeah, let's I'll check it out. I'll try it. But I don't know. It's always just such a different vibe. It just feels like a nightclub. And it's just always like this is so oddly not hot to me. It's just so. I don't know, like people playing top 40 music and the worst kind of porn on the walls. And you're just like, okay, like, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like um, there's a diff- different levels of thirst at like, say a queer play party versus a mostly the kind of hetero, maybe swinger oh, club type of thing. Yeah. Like a queer space. I mean, everybody <laughs> is like probably happily engaging in regular orgasms in their sex lives. <laughs> Everyone's there to like have fun and explore their kinks and have a good time. And at the straight ones, people are, like, desperate, usually, to make some fantasy come true, or, like, they want to watch, or, like, they're a dude who's alone who thinks, like, oh, I'm gonna find someone here and, like, have crazy time. So, I don't, it feels so much more desperate in the straight clubs. Yeah. Like, it is, I, I, I mean, I would never, like, go to them by myself, <laughs> like... I only like as a, as a woman go with other people if like a you know a bunch of my friends want to go I'm like okay if I'm with like a couple or somebody who wants to go I'm like okay but by myself it's like oh no that would no Here's a question I get asked a lot and I'm asking you because we seem to both have a similar distaste for that clubbier environment Yeah How do you find these play parties these maybe more community based parties maybe these more queer led parties Yeah I I don't I guess I feel like most places you you gotta just like hang with the queers. You gotta go hang with the gays. Uh, I'm like I don't know. I guess uh, at Dyke Day in LA, mm-hmm. I feel like my first Dyke Day when I moved here, 2019. Like they had a booth that they were just like talking about like their clubs. Like they were literally like, oh, this is like a leather club where we do this, this, and this. This is like a rope club. And, you know, I just started checking it out. And then eventually you like start following other people, talking to them, and they'll be like, oh, we all go to this place or this party. Um, so, you know, it is like a bit of like you got to put yourself out there. Uh, oh, pride. Mm-hmm. I, oh my God. We hope pride. Like everyone will be telling you about their like, oh, we're the bottoms only sex club i don't know what we do but <laughs> <laughs> we just sit around and complain we just yeah i don't know what we do but we do something i don't know but, but we're all in it together it does it's, seem there's more bottoms than tops out there in this world from, absolutely from what I'm hearing. absolutely uh so you know i think just being in community going to like queer bars you see you just people talk about it yeah uh and then i think it's actually harder to find the like swing or straight clubs like the clubby mm. ones those tend to have like very strict processes and you know you apply online send this you know you have to get approval blah 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 um so yeah i feel like those are usually harder to find they're all they're usually like hidden and Mm. stuff you know interesting because i feel like in new york like you could like google i mean at least back when they were still up like la trapeze isn't there anymore but just there were spots like you could google sex clubs and find them but they will be these cd like you just show up and you pay your ticket as opposed to like i was invited and yeah in la it's like you can google but you'll get the ones that are like yeah this is invite only you have to do this you have to have this many references 
like there are very few and if you you'll find them but they'll tell you people will be like so you have to walk in an alley it's really seedy like i wouldn't recommend going here Mm -hmm. and then the ones people are like yeah pretty good you're gonna have to like fill out applications and prove that you're cool and it's very la also when you're paying when a lot of money is being spent i also don't start trusting like consent policies at places yeah. and how they take care of uh maybe a situation because like if someone's paying like the uber vip five thousand dollar thing yeah. are you really gonna like kick them out and care if they break the rules it's yeah, it always feels like a weird energy. You can always kind of tell people want to gravitate towards like the people with like money and success. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Something I, you know, I'll I'll see be talked around in the polyamory circles that, you know, maybe you could speak to more is how do you feel like your blackness mixes in with poly? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <It's-> <laughs> I hear I mean, there's some unique uh, unique issues over there. Yeah, it's... Uh, and there are a lot of poly people of color. There are a lot of, like, poly black groups online. Mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of been lucky to always live in big cities. So I've always been able to, like, find black people, you know, in Chicago, L.A., New York. Um, so in that regard, I feel very lucky. But I do think, as a black woman who is poly, I've had to like learn new boundaries and there are so many horrible experiences that I just like didn't realize were a thing. Like there are white couples who will have rules like we're poly. My husband's allowed to date other women, but only black women. And it's like, that's weird. Have they explained it ever? (laughs) No, I didn't care to stick around long enough for an explanation. (laughs) I was just like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. And it was very like, well, he can date like other black women, but I, I, I'm the only like white woman he can date. And, you know, to me, it was like, the, I don't know, like a reverse cuck situation. Like when guys, like white guys are like, yeah. oh, like black guys fuck my wife or something. I don't know. It just felt weird and gross. Or her trying to find like one way to still feel like the special, the special woman. woman. Yeah. It just all was weird. And like, the other thing was none of us real like it wasn't something they told us it wasn't out it was just like you know i started dating this guy and then i talked to some other black poly girls i knew and we all were like we've all dated this guy <laughs> and then we all started talking about it and we were like we've all you got have, we all got, also we all kind of like looked the same a little like we were all like you know lighter skinned black women with like braids and faux locks and stuff and we all like hung out in the same kind of diy circles had tattoos and so we all kind of looked around and we're like oh huh and then we were like do you, okay clearly like his main partner is this very like like blonde white girl so it's not like a type thing yeah and do you guys know any poly white women he's maybe dated and everyone was like no and i was like currently seeing and so i just like confronted him about it and was like i'm curious about this and that's when it like kind of started coming up and it was weird Mm -hmm. and i was just like okay i'm done here oh so i don't know i think there are a lot of people who obviously in any dynamic monogamy polyamory there are people who do it with like unethical aims or purposes or just for gross reasons so you know even within monogamy i think you deal with a lot of like racism when you date interracially uh and it's the same with polyamory you know i just i'm way more selective i i try to really only date like people of color who are poly who like kind of get my level and what i'm doing and Mm -hmm. We have the same kind of experiences in life, you know, like a lot of times when I am explaining to like, put like black partners, I'm potentially saying, and I'm like, so they're just like, no, no, thank you. (laughs) They're like, they're like, no, Mm. Uh, there's also the other side of it where there is this weird, like hotep African, like patriarchal side to black monogamy where like they're like yes women should be in service to men i should i'm a king who deserves a harem and you can be like my queen as we gather women together and it's like oh no (laughs) no 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 thank you so i don't know it's weird to like balance that line but i i mean i don't i feel like there's just everybody has problems yeah. it's just hard dating <laughs> something that uh, doesn't come up as often but do, do you mind uh explaining what the hotep 
yeah. philosophy is. I mean, hoteps are like. Where to even begin with hoteps? Hoteps are people who are like, everything is a conspiracy against black people. It's like, we used to be kings and white Americans and this society is has taken our powers because of eating corn. And it'll always be like the most random weird thing. It'll be like, because they make black people eat corn, that's why our powers no longer work in the sun. And that's why we can't fly anymore. It feels like, it sounds like it like starts with a like, yeah, no, you're right. You're yeah, right. But like, then some yeah, weird thing gets like, thrown and be like, what, what? Like I was on with yeah. the oppressions. And then all of a sudden <laughs> it's like, or, you know, they like lean into the crazy stuff. Kanye is saying where they're like, we were the, you know, real native Americans and we actually founded the, and it's like always just like, none of that makes sense. And you know, they usually like, don't like people who date other races. It's like, it's just, yeah. Is there a way you can kind of like spot, a hotep on a dating app oh yeah they always make it very clear oh re- okay yeah like it's either they they either have like they usually have like dreadlocks and are wearing like dumb african symbols like egyptian symbols that they don't know the meaning of they always have stuff in their profile that's like looking for my queen you know i believe in you know submission in my partners and like stuff like that you know they they'll sometimes use the uh term foundational black american okay which is like they believe they're different from black people who come from africa because they're foundational black americans who actually were here before the native americans it's it doesn't make any sense but yeah they're just it's like you can always tell and they always are just saying wild stuff they probably listen to dr umar and yeah, if you watch Insecure, there's like a joke in the first season where like Molly goes on a date with a hotep and the hotep is just like, my queen, together we can create a kingdom and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, no, I'm not. Yeah. And like the but the beginning sounds like, oh, like king, queen equals, let's build. Uh, and then all of a sudden stuff slips in. And you're like, wait, yeah. what? what's this weird thing? I, anytime yeah. someone on a dating app messages me like, oh, queen, I'm like, like nope, mm, no, mm, no, I don't like that. Why mm, are you calling me that? I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be royalty. I don't believe in the, in the monarchy. So what, what, are you, what are you trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, the, Hit me with a hey, comrade. <laughs> like, that's. So with Solo Polly, you know, do you find any. Do you find any like loneliness in any of that? Uh not really, no. I don't know that I uh I'm someone who like really values being alone. <laughs> like I okay. love uh being on my own. I don't know, I guess that's probably why I'm like a writer and a comic cuz so much of it is just being by yourself a mm-hmm. lot of the time. Like you're alone on the road, you're alone after shows, you know, you're writing by yourself. Uh so no, I feel like to me it's that's like that's like another just benefit of it is sure. that I'm, is that I'm like oh man I get to be alone I don't feel guilty like I don't feel the guilt of I want to be by myself and there's this person who like wants to be with me that I should be prioritizing that I should be with right now it's just like oh sweet I can like not leave my house all day yeah. and I don't owe anyone anything whoo yay because you get to prioritize you. Yeah, you know, so, and I don't know, I get, like, I guess also, like I said, growing up with so many goddamn kids in my house, uh, oh, man, I love silence by myself, (laughs) like, there were always people in my house, I never, ever, like, really had, there were rare moments when it was like, oh, my gosh, I'm, like, alone, like, oh, I can just be by myself, so I think now as an adult, I really value (laughs) that ability. That's nice, that's nice. Yeah. You have like this beautiful night together and like hook up and stuff. And then afterwards, like they leave to like go home to their primary or partner. And I'm like, no, that's my favorite part. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? I love being like, oh, it's 1030. Don't you got to get home to the wife and kids? Great. And then they leave and I get to like eat ice cream in bed and watch below deck. That's the dream. I didn't think you watched that sincerely. I thought <laughs> No, I really do watch Below Deck. Okay. I was literally watching it right before you came. Below Deck met. I'm on season three. I love Captain Sandy. Well, when you were talking about like your wolf pitching you the captain person, I was like, yeah. I thought you were like begrudgingly accepting no, that. No, I was like- absolutely like, I cannot wait to interview Captain <laughs> Sandy. She's my favorite captain. She's clearly a lesbian, so she's so hey. fabulous. She like runs that boat like just 
a military man. Like she's amazing. So yeah, I I fucking love Below Deck. <laughs> Um, and as a solo poly person, I don't have to wait for anybody to watch whatever TV shows I want to watch. Okay, all, all my friends be like, "Oh, I'm watch. I started that with my partner, and I promised I wouldn't like watch the rest of Squid Games without them." I'm like, I'm gonna finish it whenever I want. I like <laughs> I I like that, but I, I you know what? It's I think I want someone to want to watch a show with me like that. So I mean, yeah. Way. I do like that. Like, if someone is like, I want to watch this with you, I am like, that is special. And please know that me agreeing means a lot. Like, if I agree to that, I did actually with Squid Games, I watched that with someone who was like, let's watch it together. And yeah, I did. I did it. Did we stay together? No. Was it worth it? Uh, But I did it. (laughs) And I could have finished Squid Games faster. So... (laughs) Well, Ashley, uh, I've I've got a couple uh, quick questions from listeners uh, uh members of my patreon community what's going yes. on everybody uh from the ask the guest channel the new new thing we got going on where y'all can propose questions to the guest uh so if it's a bad question don't blame me it wasn't no. mine nice. yesterday uh i talked to kira jones you know kira jones yeah 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 so kira she was like that's a great i, I asked the question she's like that's a great question i was like fuck uh because oh. it's not mine it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um so these two uh first one was uh, the person saw that you're a uh, big big pop person i'm a big pop person do you have a favorite strain i do uh and, and, you know, when I say I'm a big pot person, I really do. I smoke all the time, all day, every day, basically. Like, if I'm not working, it's like I'm smoking. I had to I, move weed to uh, yes, put the gear down. Put, yeah, there's a whole <laughs> ashtray. I was smoking. I like, you know, I'm a comedian. Yeah. It's, it's like basically what is required of us. Uh, so I like a weed that I can smoke all day. That's not going to get me too out of it. Uh, so my go-to is wedding cake. Uh, I generally always like a nice wedding cake. Uh, it's like a solid indica that isn't too like heavy. Uh, so I love that one. I'm more of an indica person than a sativa. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, if I am doing a sativa, I like a Viva Sativa, which is like a 46% THC sativa. It's so high and I love it. Do you have a strain that you like for like sex? Or we could also throw in just masturbation I mean, or something like that. Yeah. It like, feels any, pleasurable. Yeah, like... Yeah, because I like a more indica for that because I feel like it gets your body to like relax and like make sex and everything take longer. Um, ooh. Ooh, this is a tough. Okay, I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Gorilla Glue. Yeah, classic. Good. Yeah, Gorilla Glue is it's it gets it's yeah, it gets you sticky. It gets you just glued down wherever you are and it's like everything's in slow mo. It's like great. <laughs> so long as I can get to the bed, because if we're sitting on, as soon as my ass hits a couch on any weed, yeah. I am now on the couch. But if you can keep me up and excited and in, like if you keep me engaged, oh, we'll have like a good horny weed time. But you just gotta keep, you gotta yeah. keep, you gotta keep you me gotta, here. Yeah, keep it, Don't keep let it. me wander because I'll fall asleep on yeah. you. <laughs> you know, I yeah, I smoke so much that I just like it doesn't make me go to. Sleep. It's like you know, I, <laughs> lady, I smoke the tolerance like, is so high. And uh, the other one, uh, the other question we have for you is. Um, I guess I'll phrase it as is there when you do interviews and you do podcasts and whatnot, is there a question you kind of always wish you would get asked that no one ever fucking asked you? Oh man. I don't know. I feel like people ask me everything. I feel like I'm such a open, like on Twitter and stuff. I'm so open. People feel like, Oh, I can just ask you anything. Like people are always like, I feel like I know you, I guess people don't ask me a lot about like what TV and stuff I hate. Mm. I feel like that's something that you're not supposed to talk about. So people are never like, what do you hate out there? You want you want to take a risk right now, Ashley? (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) She's like, I want to keep my professional options open. I love all television. Famously, I think all TV is good. Uh, So, yeah. Okay. (laughs) Well, Ashley, um, thank you so much for chatting with us. You know, where can people go to find you, follow you? Great Twitter follow, if I may say. I think you're on private right now. What what happened? I am on private. I was like on some weird. Oh, you're on the. Oh, right. You were on the Antifa list. Yeah. I didn't make the list. It was like another list I don't get on. uh, Yeah, I was on it. And like, (laughs) At first, I, I locked and didn't have any, like, I wasn't getting any messages or issues, so I, like, undid it. And then today, for some reason, I started getting a ton. Maybe I, maybe it's because Kanye, like, lost his mind on InfoWars this morning, and so, like, the Twitter bots are riled up. 
but I was just like, oh, this is annoying. Like these weird replies. I'm just going to lock down. Also, I like, you know, job stuff. I'm one of those people who like is like, oh, man, just lock it down if you're looking for work. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Uh, well, where can where where are people allowed to go find you? Yeah, right? you can still go follow the Twitter. I'll, I'm going to it's not like I'm not accepting followers. <laughs> like if you were to send the request. Uh, but yeah, at the Ashley Ray on everything, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, uh, or you listen to my podcast, TV I Say with Ashley Ray, wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, you know, Spotify, Amazon, all of it. Uh, and I talk about TV and I interview your favorite writers, celebrities, comedians about what they're watching, what they, you know, really love and the TV that inspired them. So fantastic well actually this was really fun it was great to great to meet you you too always nice to meet the woman behind the tweets yeah big fan of that and uh you know why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody good thank you so much this was a fun fun time a sexy time got to just complain about polyamory one of my favorite things to do uh and i guess as i log off just remember uh all polyamorous people don't like burlesque um we aren't we don't all like it i hate it so I want to speak for the poly people who hate burlesque because I'm with you. We exist. Thanks for listening. <laughs> wait, wait, slow your roll, right? Hang on. You like smutty content. I'm give give you some more smutty content. I think we'll give you more smutty content than I normally do. If you wait one, just hang tight. Stay there another minute or so, and I, you'll be rewarded. The holidays are around the corner. I, If you ever thought about getting this fella uh, something nice, if you wanted to get me a little present, this is my soft reminder that I do have an Amazon wish list. I always have a link in the show notes, but I'm just going to kind of say it once on air just to remind you, no big deal. Uh, you can check out manwhorepod.com slash thank you. Likewise... If you're a cash daddy, if you're a money mommy, and you're not really a big fan of the whole Patreon monthly charging thing, I do have Venmo. I do have Cash App, and I always have them in the show notes. If you want to send me a little holiday bonus, my Venmo is at Billy Presida, and my Cash App is a dollar sign man whore pod. Ugh, asking for money and things always feels so gross. So I hope you can ask me for something, uh, too. Shoot me an email if you need some advice, if you have questions about the show, if you got comments or criticisms about what you've heard. You can send any and all of that to manwhorepod at gmail.com. I know Mary Beth is just going to send me her tits, and that just seems to be what is the new uh, thing since I've reopened that Pandora's box or, or undid Pandora's bra, I think would be more appropriate description. I hope to see y'all a hot movie night on Tuesday the 20th, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Link in the show notes for more information. Second to last, but not second to least. If you want to give me a gift that is 100% free, it costs you absolutely nothing. And it actually does the most for me. Take a risk this holiday season. 2023, it's new year, new you. New unashamed social media posting. If you would, I would love, love, love it the most if you would share a link to the Man Whore podcast in your social media, like your real one, your your totally normal vanilla socials, because every year the podcasting research always says that word of mouth from friends social media is the number one way people find out about new podcasts. So uh, make my day and share the show publicly, unashamedly, unabashedly, and I will love the fuck out of you for it. Now, there is no bonus episode with Ashley Ray tomorrow, so I am sharing a quite the teaser from an old bonus episode, from an old Craigslist chronicle about uh, my junior year of college when I went to this couple's apartment in New Jersey, and and, and they, they watched me beat off, and then it it evolved into a thing. What's the kicker? It was with a lady and her gay best friend gain access to nearly 300 bonus episodes on the Patreon. Enjoy the tease pretty please and stay slutty. (laughs) 
and I'm smiling at both of them and I'm stroking my cock and I'm now standing directly in front of her and he's sitting right next to her. So he's with an arm length of my thigh and she, my cock's right in front of um, her face while my hand is wrapped around it. And I'm smiling at her and she's looking up smiling at me and it, it, oh my God, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting hard just, just remembering this. Um, I don't know if you've ever had so many people stare at you in such lust, uh, for, for the ladies out there in respectful lust. I know you got, you're, you're getting looked at with lust every day, too much lust. But if you ever just in a, in a setting, been the center of attention, no one's touching you, you're running your own show and you're just looking at two people who really want to fuck you and they can't or they're not and they're just watching and you know that in a moment they all they if you were if if just given the permission they would reach out and touch you they would it's one of the times i've been the most turned on in my entire life being that object of desire and you could just see it in their eyes they're like oh this this boy's really cute you know, I you know I've I'd suffer from the body dysmorphia, so I I certainly don't think I'm I'm much to look at. But I finally gave it a shot, and I tossed it out. There. I said, "Do you want to touch?" And she she asked if that would be okay. Huh? So silly. Would that be okay? <laughs> uh, I was like, "Yeah, I, I'd like you to touch. I'd like you to take it." And uh, and she starts touching my legs, starts touching my thighs. And I'm stroking my cock and I'm trying to kind of like inch the cock towards the hand. Whichever hand is closest to the groin, like I'm moving it that direction. And if the other one starts getting higher up the thigh, well, then I'm switching the shaft over there too. And she eventually takes a hold of it in her hand. She gives it a couple strokes and then she looks at her friend and she says, well, I don't want him to feel left out. And I very quickly did some some straight guy gay math in my head ever been pulled over and asked if you've been drinking and a series of random pop culture questions you don't listen to classic conversations with jeff duoska and you could be looking at five to ten years behind bars Arm yourself with stories and trivia from Hot Lips from MASH, Frau Farbissena from Austin Powers, The Smoky Man from The X-Files, Isaac Dofer, Doc from The Love Boat, over 150 interviews to keep you on the streets. Classic Conversations, it's wherever you find podcasts. 